that used to be my nickname, the film partially responsible for the switch. Hot dog water? I'm assuming Tenet. Tenet. Remember? His, his name on Discord was Tenet GG or whatever. I still think it's better to think of him as hot dog water. It's so much funnier. Mm. So, tonight, for a second reading, we'll be reading excerpt from the Brothers Karamazov. Oh, fuck. This looks wordy. Oh, it is. By Fyodor Dostoevsky. It's wordy, but it's passionate. Uh, again, I'll reiterate for anybody coming in here. This excerpt is the Grand Inquisitor. It's also where the quote is from tonight. Hey, what's up, Shadow Warden? So um, I'm going to put a marker real quick. So this is from Brothers Karamazov, the Grand Inquisitor. It is a poem slash speech slash way that Ivan Karamazov fucks with Alyosha um, in kind of just shitting on the church via this this story. Now, Ivan Karamazov is the atheist um, intellectual brother of the Karamazov. Dostoevsky. Sorry. Dostoevsky. Sorry about that. Um, so, Ivan is kind of like the intellectual elite uh, atheist of the family. Um, there's Dmitri, who was just like the father, who was a womanizer and a piece of shit. And there was Alyosha or Alexei, um, who was sent off to a monastery. Um, these are the brothers. Um, spoiler alert, if you've never read this book, being that it came out in 1880. Everyone um, dies. Um, well, no, Dimitri dies. The father dies. The butler, who turns out to be the half-brother of them, hangs himself. And then Ivan, from guilt of think realizing that his writings and atheistic beliefs caused the butler to kill his father and then hang himself, goes crazy and is sent to a prison in Siberia. And then Alyosha is the only one left. So basically everybody dies. I was just fucking around. Uh, no, yeah. no, it is a it is not a happy ending. The only happy ending is like the excerpt of the children that Alyosha stops from bullying a man and they become like good Christian Orthodox sort of boys that inspire him towards his pilgrimage and what was meant to be further books. But that's a sidebar. So, this is... What is... God, really, posture check? We're both sitting up. Right? What's that? What were you going to say? That's it. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, so, it's a very emboldened, very passionate speech. I want you to pay attention to some certain themes as we go through this. So, this is understanding that this is... You don't read Dostoevsky for happy times? No, you don't. You don't. Um... Crime and punishment, way worse. Record. Way darker. As a matter of fact, Mark, you might really be into that book. Is there lots of nudity and gory death? Gory death, yes. Not a lot of nudity in any book. Um, but, so Ivan is attempting to kind of shock his brother, um, the monk, um, with this story. Um, this story is meant to attack the church, but also meant to attack these hierarchical institutions. Um, and in, in some ways is Dostoevsky doing the best he can to steel man the atheists that are against the church, as well as the anarchist position against the state and against hierarchical structures and everything. This is the best argumentation he has the evil of like the state and the church and the fallacy of man and the nature of man. Um, of course, you know, Dostoevsky was a devout Christian, but I will begin. Even this, you must, even this must have a preface that is a literary preface, laughed Ivan. And I am a poor hand at making one. You see, my actions take place in the 16th century. And at that time, as you probably learned in school, it was customary in poetry to bring down heavenly powers on earth. Not to speak of Dante in France, clerks as well as the monks in the monasteries used to give regular performances in which the man, Madonna, 
the saints, the angels, Christ, and God himself were brought on the stage. In those days, it was done in all simplicity. In Victor Hugo's Notre Dame on de Paris, an edifying and gratuitous spectacle was provided for the people in the Hotel de Ville of Paris. In the reign of Louis, the, Louis XI, in honor of the birth of the Dauphin, it was Le Bon Judgment de la Très Sainte <laughs> et Gracias Verge Marie, and she appears herself on the stage and pronounces her Bon Judgment. Similar plays, chiefly from the Old Testament, were occasionally performed in Moscow too, up to the times of Peter the Great. But besides, the, <clears throat> but besides plays, there were all sorts of legends and ballads scattered around the world in which the saints and angels and all the powers of heaven took part when required. In our monasteries, the monks busied themselves in translating, copying, and even composing such poems. And even under the Tartars, there is, for instance, one such poem, of course, from the Greek, The Wanderings of Our Lady Through Hell, with descriptions as bold as Dante's. Our Lady visits hell, and the Archangel Michael sends her through the torments. She sees the sinners and their punishment. She sees... <clears throat> There she sees, among others, one noteworthy set of sinners in a burning lake. Some of them sink to the bottom of the lake so that they can't swim out. And these God forgets an expression of extraordinary depth and force. And so Our Lady, shocked and weeping, falls before the throne of God and begs for mercy for, for all in hell, <clears throat> for all she has seen there indiscriminately. Her conversation with God is immensely in interesting. She beseech him. She will not desist. And when God points to the hands and feet of her son nailed to the cross and asks, how can I give his tormentors? She bids all the saints, all the martyrs, all the angels and archangels to fall down with her and pray for mercy on all without distinction. It ends by her winning from God a respite of suffering every year from Good Friday till Trinity Day. And the sinners at once raise a cry of thankfulness from hell, chanting, Thou art just, O Lord, in this judgment. Well, my poem would have been of that if it had appeared at that time. He comes on the scene in my poem, but he says nothing, only appears and passes on. Fifteen centuries have passed since he promised to come in his glory. Fifteen centuries since his prophet wrote, Behold, I come quickly. <laughs> of that day and that hour knoweth no man, neither the Son but the Father, as he himself predicted on earth. But humanity awaits him the same faith and with the same love. Oh, with greater faith. For it is fifteen centuries since man has ceased to see signs from heaven. No signs from heaven come today to add to what the heart doth say. So basically he's saying that in his poem, he's kind of using the idea of God coming down to earth to tell the story as we might have, do, as we might have once done. And then he's kind of cheekingly making it in the 16th century to make fun of the fact that it's been 15 centuries since God says he comes quickly. And uh, still, where the fuck is God and where are the signs of God here? Anyone that believes in God is an idiot. Kind of jokingly. He's literally called Blizzard. <laughs> oh, this is a lot of Russian media. I keep trying to think of things to suggest that are uplifting. And it's always a bit of a struggle. Yeah. All right, continuing. There was nothing left but faith in what the hearth doth say. It is true there were many miracles in those days. There were saints who performed miraculous cures. Some holy people, according to their biographies, were visited by the queen of heaven herself. But the devil did not slumber, and doubts were already arising among men of the truth of these miracles. And just when they appeared in the north of Germany, a terrible new heresy, a huge star like to, like to a torch, that is, to a church, fell on the sources of the waters, and they became bitter. These heretics began blasphemously denying miracles, but those who remained faithful were all the more ardent in their faith. The tears of humanity rose up to him as before, awaited his coming, loved him, hoped for him, yearned to suffer and die for him as before. In so many ages mankind had prayed with faith and fervor, O Lord our God, hasten thy coming. So many ages called upon him that in his infinite mercy he deigned to come down to his servants. Before that day, he had come down. He had visited some holy men, martyrs and hermits, as is written in their lives among us. Tuchtev, 
which absolute faith in the truth of his words bore that, bearing the cross in slavish dress, weary and worn the heavenly king, our mother Russia come to bless, and through our land went wandering. And that certainly I was, I assure you. Again, God comes down occasionally, talks to people, but now he's, he's coming, coming. And behold, he deigned to appear for a moment to the people, to the tortured, suffering people, sunk in, in, in iniquity, but loving him like children. My story is laid in Spain, in Seville, in the most terrible time of the Inquisition, when fires were lighted every day to the glory of God, and in splendid auto de fe, the wicked heretics were burnt. Oh, of course, this was not the coming in which he will appear, according to his promise, at the end of time, in all his heavenly glory, and which will be sudden as lightning flashing from east to west. No, he visited his children only for a moment, and there where the flames were crackling round the heretics. In his infinite mercy, he came once more among men, and that human shape which he walked among men for 33 years, 15 centuries ago. He came down to the hot pavements of the southern town in which on the day before almost a hundred heretics had, ad majorum glorium day, been burnt by the cardinal, the grand inquisitor, in a magnificent auto de fe, in the presence of the king, the court, the knights, the cardinals, the most charming ladies of the court, and the whole population of Seville. So he's saying Jesus is coming, and it's coming in the time of the grand of the inquisition in seville spain when they're just burning witches by the hundreds jesus is coming look busy <laughs> look busy he came softly unobserved and yet strange to say everyone recognized him that might be one of the best passages in the poem i mean why they recognized him the people are irresistibly drawn to him they surround him they flock about him follow him he moves silently in their midst with a gentle smile of infinite compassion the sun of love burns in his heart and powers shine from his eyes and their radiance shed on the people stirs their hearts with responsive love he holds out his hands to them blesses them and a healing virtue comes from contact with him even with his garments an old man in the crowd, blind from childhood, cries out, O oh Lord, heal me, and I shall see thee. And, as it were, scales fall from his eyes, and the blind man sees him. The crowd weeps and kisses the earth under his feet. Children throw flowers before him, sing, and cry, Hosanna. It is he, it is he, repeat. It must be he, it can be no one but him. He stops at the steps of the Seville Cathedral. At the moment when the weeping mourners are bringing in a little open white coffin, in it lies a child of seven, the only daughter of a prominent citizen. The dead child lies hidden in flowers. He will raise your child, the crowd shouts to the weeping mother. The priest coming to meet the coffin looks perplexed and frowns. But the mother of the dead child throws herself at his feet with a wail. If it is thou, raise my child, she cries, holding out her hands to him. The procession halts. The coffin is laid on the steps at his feet. He looketh with compassion. Hey! What's, What's up? up, last username? What's up, last username? What's up, everyone watching the conversation between last username and um, um, Liquid Zulu? We just started. We're just barely into our second piece. First piece we read was talking about um, Rothbard and Mises and Vaith and their ideas of um, subjectivism in um, in in ethics and in uh, sorry in values pursuant to uh, free market capitalism. But now we are reading um, the Grand Inquisitor. The last username. I intend to watch the vod. I watch parts and like the energy. Yeah, I did too. Um, oh, nice. Uh, nice. So we're talking about the um, Grand Inquisitor now. Um, we just started. We're just a couple paragraphs in. And Alyosha is listening to Ivan Karamazov explain to him uh, the beginning of his poem. And the poem is meant to be an attack on socialism, an attack on the state, an attack on um, hierarchical structures, and an attack most importantly and most fervently 
on the Christian faith and church and Jesus Christ himself. And it is a claim that Jesus Christ is immoral for not accepting the three, um, the three gifts that Satan gave him, um, that he rejected based off of faith. It is an amazing piece of literature um, that is the most steel man version of atheism against the church that probably has ever been written um, by um, Dostoevsky. And so far in the story, Ivan is basically exclaiming that Jesus has come back, that it's normal in poems like these, that um, that the religious, um, that, that, that gods and angels would come to earth and that Jesus has come back and he has come back performing miracles in the time of the um, Inquisition um, in Seville, Spain. So let us continue. Procession halts. The coffin is laid on the steps at his feet. He looks with compassion and his lips once more softly pronounce, maiden arise. And the maiden arises. The little girl sits up in the coffin and looks round, smiling with wide open, wondering eyes, holding a bunch of white roses that had been put in her hand. There are cries, sobs, confusion among the people. And at that moment, the Cardinal himself, the Grand Inquisitor, passes by the cathedral. He's an old man, almost 90, tall and erect, with a withered face and sunken eyes in which there is still a gleam of light. He's not dressed in his gorgeous Cardinal's robes as he was the day before when he was burning the enemies of the Roman church. At this moment, he is wearing his coarse old monk's cassock. At a distance behind him come his gloomy assistants and slaves and the, quote, holy guard. He stops at the sight of the crowd and watches it from a distance. He sees everything. He sees them set the coffin down at his feet. Sorry. Sees the child rise up and his face darkens. He knits his thick gray brown brows and his eyes gleam with a sinister fire. He holds out his finger and bids the guards take him. And such is his power. So completely are the people cowed into submission and trembling obedience to him that the crowd immediately makes way for the guards. And in the midst of death-like silence, they lay hands on him and lead him away. The crowd instantly bows down to the earth like one man before the old inquisitor. He blesses the people in silence and passes on. The guards lead their prisoner to the close, gloomy, vaulted prison and the ancient palace of the holy inquisition and shut him in it the day passes and is followed by the dark burning breathless night of seville the air is fragrant with laurel and lemon in the pitch darkness the iron door of the prison is suddenly opened and the grand inquisitor himself comes in with a light in his hand he is alone the door is closed at once behind him he stands in the doorway and for a minute or two gazes into his face. At last he goes up slowly, sets the light on the table and speaks. What's up, Sami G? Just reading, uh, just reading Dostoevsky. It's an intense ass piece of some of the greatest literature ever. So Inquisitor has captured Jesus, thrown him in the dungeon. And now the grand Inquisitor and the people literally gave up Jesus Christ to uh, their masters because they were told to do so. Well, no one expects the Spanish Inquisition. Mm. No one expects the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> so the Grand Inquisitor says, Is it thou? Thou? For receiving no answer, he's, he adds at once, Don't answer. Be silent. What canst thou say indeed? I know too well what thou wouldst say. And thou hast no right to add anything to what thou had said of old. Why, then, art thou come to hinder us? For thou hast come to hinder us, and thou knowest that. But dost thou know what will be tomorrow? I know not who thou art, and care not to know whether it is thou or only a semblance of him. But tomorrow I shall condemn thee and burn thee at the stake as the worst of heretics. And the very people who have today kissed thy feet tomorrow at the faintest sign from me will rush to heap up the embers of thy fire. Knowest thou that? Yes, maybe thou knowest it, he added with thoughtful penetration, never for a moment taking his eyes off the prisoner. That's hot. 
I don't quite understand, Ivan. What, what does it mean, Alyosha, who had been listening in silence, said with a smile. Is it simply a wild fantasy or a mistake on part of the old man, some impossible quid pro quo? Take it at last, said Ivan, laughing. <laughs> if you are so corrupted by modern realism and can't stand anything fantastic, if you like it to be the case of mistaken identity, let it be so. It is true, he went on laughing. The old man was 90, and he might well be crazy over his set idea. He might have been struck by the appearance of the prisoner. It might, in fact, be simply his ravings, the delusion of an old man of 90, overexcited by the auto de fe of a hundred heretics the day before. But does it matter to us, after all, whether it was a mistake of identity or wild fantasy? All that matters is that the old man should speak out, that he should speak openly of what he has thought in silence for 90 years. And the prisoner too is silent? Does he look at him and not say a word? That's inevitable in any case, Ivan laughed again. The old man has told him he hasn't the right to add anything to what he had said of old. One may say it is the most fundamental feature of Roman Catholicism, in my opinion at least. All has been given by thee to the Pope, they say, and all, therefore, is still in the Pope's hands, and there is no need for thee to come now at all. Thou must not meddle for the time, at least. Thou, <clears throat> that's how they speak and write to the Jesuits, at any rate. I have read it myself in the works of their theologians. Hast thou the right to reveal to us one of the mysteries of that world which thou hast come? My old man asks him and answers the question for him. No, thou hast not. That, that thou mayest not add to what has been said of old, and mayest not take from men the freedom which thou didst exalt when thou was on earth. Whatsoever thou revealest anew will encroach on men's freedoms, freedom of faith, for it will be manifest as miracle, and the freedom of their faith was dearer to thee than anything in those days 1,500 years ago. Didst thou not often say then, I will make you free? But now thou hast seen these, quote, free men, the old man adds suddenly with a pensive smile. Yes, we've paid dearly for it, he goes on looking sternly at him. But at last we have completed that work in thy name. For 15 centuries we've been wrestling with thy freedom, but now it is ended and over and good. Dost thou not believe that it's over for good? Thou lookest meekly at me, and deignest not even to wroth me with me. But let me tell thee that now, today, people are more persuaded than ever that they have perfect freedom, yet they have brought their freedom to us and laid it humbly at our feet. But that has been our doing. Was this what thou didst? Was this thy freedom? Big oof. That's rough. Right. He's saying you ha you give people free will, but you would deny them the freedom to believe in something if you would make yourself known. Right. It's 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 a play on words, a trick on the ideas of freedom. And he says, like, you gave all of these people freedom. You freed these people to be who they are. And what have they done? They've come to the church with faith and they've given us all of their freedom. They've laid their freedom at our feet, and that's finally complete because they have the freedom of faith to obey us. They have made, uh, they have made themselves slaves willingly to us, and slaves to the faith and the church. Is this what um, Walter Block was talking about? <laughs> I don't know about all that. So Alyosha breaks in again. Uh, I don't understand again, Alyosha broke in. Is he ironical? Is he jesting? Not a bit of it. He claims it is a merit for uh, for himself and his church that as they that at last they have vanquished freedom and have done so to make men happy. For now, he's speaking of the Inquisition, of course. For the first time, it has become possible to think of the happiness of men. Man was created a rebel. And how can rebels be happy? Thou wast warned, he says to him. Thou hast had no lack of admon admonitions and warnings, but thou didst not listen to those warnings. Thou didst reject the only way by which men might be made happy. But fortunately, departing thou didst hand on the work to us. 
Thou hast promised. Thou hast established by thy Lord. Thou hast given to us the right to bind and unbind. And now, of course, thou canst not think of taking it away. Why then hast thou come to hinder us? So he's saying people could be free or they can be content. They can be happy. Now we have a society where people give up their freedom so that they can be happy and content. Who needs freedom when you can have flourishment and bread happiness? And, bread and circus. It's bread and circus, yeah. And what's the meaning of no lack of admonitions and warnings, Asal Aliosha? Why, that's the chief part of what the old man must say. The wise and dead dread spirit, the spirit of self-destruction and non-existence, the old man goes on. Great spirit talked with thee in the wilderness, and we are told in the books that he tempted thee. So when he's saying great spirit in the wilderness and tempted thee, um, it's important to know that he's talking about Satan. He's talking about Old the devil. Scratch. Oh, Scratch. <laughs> So it wasn't, so but what's weird is like it wasn't until kind of this time period that this was written that well really in America it was in like the Second the sixties yeah. <clears throat> well yeah the sixties that uh the nineteen sixties like when uh, the Exorcist and some of those horror movies came out mm -hmm. that's when the concept of Satan as a as a physical entity really started to spread in most other literature it was more of a an idea of evil. Yeah, but the evangelicals of the Second Great Awakening in America doesn't really <laughs> spread until later. But yeah, so this is written in the 1880s, though. Yeah, that's that's what I think is interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So he's talking about Satan here for the reader. So um, the is that so? And could anything truer be said than what he revealed to thee in three questions, and what thou didst reject? And what in the books is called the temptation? And yet, if there has ever been on earth a real stupendous miracle, it took place on that day, on the day of the three temptations. The statement of those three questions was itself the miracle. If it were possible to imagine simply for the sake of argument that those three questions of the dread spirit had perished utterly from the books and that we had to restore them and to invent them anew and to do so had gathered together all the wise men of the earth, rulers, chief priests, learned men, philosophers, poets, and had set them to task to invent three questions such as would not only fit the occasion, but express in three words, three human phrases, the whole future of the world and of humanity. Dost thou believe that all the wisdom of the earth united could have invented anything in depth and force equal to the three questions which were actually put to thee than by the wise and mighty spirit of the wilderness? He's saying that these were the perfect and most wise and best things that Satan could ask and tempt Jesus with. From those questions alone, from the miracle of their statement, we can see that that we have here to do not with the fleeting human intelligence, but with the absolute and eternal. For in those three questions, the whole subsequent history of mankind is, as it were, brought together into one whole and foretold, and in them are united in the unsolved historical contradictions of human nature. At the time, it could not be so clear since the future was unknown. But now that 1500 years have passed, we see that everything in those three questions was so justly divined and foretold and has been so truly fulfilled that nothing can be added to them or taken from them. Judge thyself who was right, thou or he who questioned thee then. Remember the first question. Its meaning, in other words, was this. Thou wouldest go into the world and, and art going with empty hands with some promise of freedom, which men in their simplicity and their natural unruliness cannot even understand, which they fear and dread, for nothing has ever been more insupportable for a man and a human society than freedom. But ceased thou, these stones in this parched and barren wilderness turn them into bread, and mankind will run after thee like a flock of sheep, grateful and obedient. 
though forever trembling, lest thou withdraw thy hand and deny them thy bread. But thou wouldest not deprive man of freedom and didst reject the offer, thinking, what is that freedom worth if obedience is bought with bread? Thou didst reply that man lives not by bread alone. But dost thou know that for the sake of that earthly bread, the spirit of the earth will rise up against thee and will strive with thee and overcome thee. And all will follow him crying, who can compare with this beast? He has given us fire from heaven. Dost thou know that the ages will pass and humanity will, will proclaim by the lips of their sages that there is no crime and therefore no sin. There is only hunger. Feed men and ask them what of virtue. That's what they'll write on the banner, which they will raise against thee and with which they will destroy thy temple. Where thy temple stood will rise a new building. The terrible tower of Babel will be built again. And though like the old one, it will not be finished. Yet thou mightiest have prevented that new tower and have cut short the sufferings of men for a thousand years. For they will come back to us after a thousand years of agony with their tower. They will seek us again, hidden underground in the catacombs. For we shall be again persecuted and tortured. They will find us and cry to us, feed us. For those who have been promised fire from heaven haven't given it. And then we shall finish building their tower, for he finishes the building who feeds them. And we alone shall feed them in thy name, declaring falsely that it is in thy name. Oh, never, never can they feed themselves without us. No science will give them bread so long as they remain free. In the end, they will lay their freedom at our feet and say to us, make us your slaves, but feed us. They will understand themselves at last that freedom and bread enough for all are inconceivable together. For never, never will they be able to share between them. They will be convinced too that they can never be free for they are weak, vicious, worthless, and rebellious. Thou didst promise them the bread of heaven, but I repeat again, can it compare with earthly bread and the eyes of the weak, ever sinful and ignoble race of man? And it... For the sake of the bread of heaven, thousands shall follow thee. What is it to become of the millions and tens of thousands of millions of creatures who will not have the strength to forego the earthly bread for the sake of the heavenly? Or dost thou care only for the tens of thousands of the great and strong, while the millions, numerous as the sands of the sea, who are weak but love thee, must exist only for the sake of the great and strong? No, we care for the weak too. They are sinful and rebellious, but in the end, they too will become obedient. They will marvel at us and look on us as gods because we are ready to endure the freedom which they found so dreadful and to rule over them. So awful it will seem to have to them to be free. But we shall tell them that we are thy servants and rule them in thy name. We shall deceive them again, for we will not let thee come to us again. That deception will be our suffering. We shall be forced to lie. This, this paragraph, this section is so beautifully explains the authoritarianism of the church, the authoritarianism of communism, socialism, and of the state. It is this idea that they, that they, the ends justify the means of lying to people and saying that they're doing things in the name of good and righteousness to make slaves of people so that they can all be, they can be free from hunger. They can be free. And this is, this is Dostoevsky explaining positive and negative rights before, before any of this shit, right? This is 1880. He's explaining how socialists use the idea of positive and negative rights to steal you of your freedom. Except he's doing it in the form of the church. As a devout Christian. I think that's aimed at you. It's bullshit, though. Freedom versus prosperity is a false dichotomy. As Austro-Libertarian theory has shown in experience. Yeah. I'm an anarcho-capitalist. Obviously, I agree. <laughs> 
but it's it's amazing how he shows the the logic from the statist the logic from the the inquisitor but he's using it to steel man the position of the flawed institutions and how atheism comes apart like why atheism exists because really the brothers karamazov is a book about this giving the devil his due in terms of the surging atheism within Russia at the time. Of course, a lot of his work was divinely inspired by epileptic seizures, so no. Uh, I mean, that's that happened to a guy in the 50s, 60s, I think. He had a brain tumor, mm. and uh, or maybe his kid did, and like he just suddenly kind of got divinely inspired and like knew the treatment uh and then he died of like a brain hemorrhage of course of course Dostoevsky doesn't have an understanding of modern economics and even still it's a it's a steel man of someone else's arguments which is the new surging atheist um socialist intellectuals right this is the this is this is Ivan Karamazov is is you know a representative of the of the you know the the kind of the French intellectual you know the, the movement of of socialism and and atheism right and he's telling this story to Alyosha monk um as an attack on the church but it in many ways it it's it's an attack on the church from Ivan but it's really a metaphor for statists and and the the flaws of the human institutions that gain power and rule over man and how they justify the evil of their rule and it's and it's obviously the evil of the rule because the grand inquisitor is willing to interrogate and murder Jesus Christ in order to maintain his power because he believes that miracles and freedom are wrong what 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 is necessary is obedience to the state i had i had something funny i was gonna say and i'm sorry <laughs> all right i'll continue yeah but yeah no we're not we, we don't we don't just read uh crams we don't just read like philosophy that specifically is like our philosophy philosophy reading we try and read other people that we disagree with or things that just kind of get us all thinking and engaging. Yeah, in the end, Dostoy supported the privatization of Russian communal, communal land and said private property makes men out of animals. I Honestly, I don't know Dostoevsky's uh, politics in, in that, but that wouldn't surprise me at all. But again, that makes sense reading this. This reading is, again, it's... Ivan is in many ways a character that Dostoevsky is fighting against. These are Ivan's words, right? But he's also trying to steel man them. I mean, I think the hero of the story, if there is one, it's more like the sole survivor is Alyosha Karamazov or Alexei Karamazov, depending on your translation. Again, I need a Russian to read it to tell me the real name. Um, Ivan is... Ivan is the one that literally gets the butler via his argumentation. This very argumentation causes his half-brother to murder his father and then commit suicide and then causes Ivan to go insane and get sent to Siberia. So, obviously this isn't, if there is a, if there's a bad guy of the story, these are the words from the bad guy. All right, so. Continuing on. This is the significance of the first question in the wilderness. Again, he's talking about the first of the three temptations that Satan had for Jesus. And this is what thou hast rejected for the sake of that freedom, which thou hast exalted above everything. Yet in this question lies, the, lies hid the great secret of this world. Choosing bread, thou wouldest have satisfied the universal and everlasting craving of humanity to find someone to worship. So long as man remains free, he strives for nothing so incessantly and so painfully as to find someone to worship. But man seeks to worship what is established beyond dispute, so that all men would agree at once 
to worship it. For these pitiful creatures are concerned not only to find what one or another can worship, but to find community of worship is the chief misery of every man individually and all of humanity from the beginning of time. For the sake of common worship, they've slain each other with the sword. They have set up gods and challenged one another. Put away your gods and come and worship ours, or we'll kill you and your gods. And so it will be to the end of the world. Even when gods disappear from the earth, they will fall down before idols just the same. Thou didst know, thou couldst not have been, but have known this fundamental secret of human nature. But thou didst reject the one infallible banner, which was offered thee to make all men bound down to thee alone, the banner of earthly bread. And thou hast rejected it for the sake of freedom and the bread of heaven. Behold, what thou didst further. And all again in the name of freedom, I tell thee that man is tormented by no greater anxiety than to find someone quickly to whom he can hand over that gift of freedom with which the ill-fated creature is born. But only one who can appease their conscience can take over their freedom. In bread there was offered thee an invincible banner. Give bread and man will worship thee. For nothing is more certain than bread. But if someone else gains possession of his conscience, oh, then he will cast away thy bread and follow after him who has ensnared his conscience. In that thou wast right. For the secret of man's being is not only to live, but to have something to live for. Without a stable conception of the object of life, man would not consent to go on living and would rather destroy himself than remain on earth, though he had bread in abundance. That is true. But what happened? Instead of taking man's freedom from them, thou didst make it greater than ever. Didst thou forget that man prefers peace and even death to freedom of choice and the knowledge of good and evil? Nothing is more seductive for man than his freedom of conscience, but nothing is a greater cause of suffering. And behold, Instead of giving a firm foundation for setting the conscience of man at rest forever, thou didst choose all of this exceptional, vague, and enigmatic. Thou didst choose what was utterly beyond the strength of men, acting as though thou didst not love them at all. Thou who didst come to, to give thy life for them, instead of taking possession of men's freedoms, thou didst increase it and burden the spiritual kingdom of mankind with its sufferings forever. Thou didst desire man's free love, then he should follow thee, f thee freely, enticed and taken captive by thee, in place of the rigid ancient law. Man must hereafter, with free heart, decide for himself what is good and what is evil, having only thy image before him as his guide. But didst thou not know that he would at last reject even thy image and thy truth, if he is weighed down with the fearful burden of free choice, thou will cry aloud at last with the truth is not in thee. For they could not have been left in greater confusion and suffering than thou hast caused, laying upon them so many cares and unanswerable problems. So here he's attacking the very idea of right, that, 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 that man has been burdened with the idea of choice. And that by being given the knowledge of good and evil, but not really knowing what is good and evil, said having to, to try and figure out good and evil based off of Jesus as a guide, he has basically giving them an unending torment of this, of this need to avoid sin. And that if he truly loved people, he wouldn't give them freedom at all. He would have taken away that freedom of choice and they would have just been good by default. But he must have hated man to give him freedom and free choice. Oh, is Mika coming to say hi? Yeah, she just kind of hopped in my lap. Hmm. Jamar Chase. I have no idea who that is. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Do you know the way? Protect the queen. Oh my god. Only the beginning of that came through and I'm already offended. <laughs> Dude, what is that fucking smell? Which one? It smells like dryer sheets. Like, 
cream. I've been smelling it too. Yeah. Yeah, you're not crazy. I thought I thought it was your vape. No. No, 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 no. All right, we're gonna continue here in just a second, but scratch my head. Getting some some water. I think it must be like a vent from the laundry machine or something. I must be doing a fuck tunnel. Mm, maybe. Andy says, sorry, that was with, a, with, a, with an image of an ass. Where do you get these emotes? Those are from? knees. That's Zygnia Krolsifer's uh, knees emote. Who's Zygnia Krolsifer? I don't know that they stream anymore. Okay, fair enough. All right, let's continue. So that in truth, thou didst thyself lay the foundation for the destruction of thy kingdom, and no one is more to blame for it. Yet what was offered thee? There are three powers, three powers alone, able to conquer and to hold captive forever the conscience of these impotent rebels for their happiness. These forces are miracle, mystery, and authority. Thou hast rejected all three and hast set the example for doing so. When the wise and dread spirits set thee on the pinnacle of the temple and said to thee, If thou wouldest know whether thou art the Son of God, then cast thyself down. For it is written, The angels shall hold him up, lest he fall down and bruise himself. And thou shalt know then whether thou art the Son of God, and shalt prove then how great is thy faith in thy father. But thou didst refuse, and wouldst not cast thyself down. Oh, of course, thou didst proudly and well, like God. But the weak, unruly race of men, are they gods? Oh, thou didst know then, that in taking one step, and making one movement to cast thyself down, thou wouldst be tempting God, and have lost all thy faith in him, and wouldst have been dashed to pieces against the earth which thou didst come to save. And the wise spirit that tempted thee would have rejoiced. But I ask again, are there many like thee? And couldst thou believe for one moment that men too could face such a temptation? Is the nature of men such that they can reject miracle and at the great moments of their life, the moments of their deepest, most agonizing spiritual difficulties, cling only to the free verdict of the heart? Oh. Thou didst know that thee would be recorded in books, would be handed down to remote times and to utmost ends of earth, and thou didst hope that man following thee would cling to God and not ask for a miracle. But thou didst not know that when man rejects miracle, he rejects God too. For man seeks not so much God as the miraculous. And as man cannot bear to be without the miraculous, he will create new miracles for him, for his own, for himself. And will worship deeds of sorcery and witchcraft, though he might be a hundred times over a rebel, heretic, and infidel. Thou didst not come down from the cross when they shouted to thee, mocking and reviling thee. Come down from the cross, and we will believe that thou art he. Thou didst not come down... For again, thou wouldst not enslave man by miracle, and didst crave faith given freely, not based on miracle. Thou didst crave for free love and not the base raptures of the slave before the might that has overawed him forever. But thou didst think too highly of men therein, for they are slaves, of course the rebellious by nature. Look round and judge. Fifteen centuries have passed. Look upon them. Whom hast thou raised up to thyself? I swear, man is weaker and baser by nature than thou hast believed him. Can he, can he do that, do what thou didst? By showing him so much respect, thou didst, as it were, cease to feel for him. For thou didst ask for too much from him. Thou who hast loved him more than thyself, respecting him less, thou wouldst have asked less of him. That would have been more like love, or his burden would have been lighter. He is weak and vile. But thou, he is everywhere now rebelling against our power and proud of his rebellion. It is the pride of a child and a schoolboy. 
They are little children rioting and barring out the teacher at school. But their childish delight will end. It will cost them dear. Mankind as a whole has always striven to organize a universal state. There have been many great nations with great histories, but the more highly they were developed, the more unhappy they were. For they felt more acutely than other people the craving for worldwide union. The great conquerors, Timors and Genghis Khans, whirled like hurricanes over the face of the earth, striving to subdue its people. And they too were but the unconscious expression of the same craving for universal unity. Hadst thou taken the world and Caesar's purple, thou wouldst have founded the universal state and have given universal peace. For who can rule men if not he who holds the conscience and their bread in his hands? We have taken the sword of Caesar, and in taking it, of course, have rejected thee and followed him. Oh, ages are yet to come of the confusion of free thought, of their science and cannibalism. For having begun to build their tower of Babel without us, they will end, of course, with cannibalism. But then the beasts will crawl to us and lick our feet and spatter them with the tears of blood. And we shall sit upon the beast and raise the cup, and on it will be written mystery. And then, only then, the reign of peace and happiness will come for men. Thou art proud of thine elect, but thou hast only the elect, while we give rest to all. And besides, how many of those elect, those mighty ones who could become elect, have grown weary waiting for thee? and have transferred and will transfer the powers of their spirit and the warmth of their heart to the other camp and end by raising their free banner against thee. Thou didst thyself lift up that banner, but with us all will be happy and will no more rebel nor destroy one another as under thy freedom. Oh, we shall persuade them that they will only become free when they renounce their freedom to us and submit to us. And shall we be right or shall we be lying? They will be convinced that we are right, for they will remember the horrors of slavery and confusion to which thy freedom brought them. Freedom, free thought, and science will lead them into such straits and will bring them face to face with such marvels and insoluble mysteries that some of them, Fierce and rebellious will destroy themselves. Others, rebellious but weak, will destroy one another, while the rest, weak and unhappy, will crawl, fawning to our feet and whine to us. Yes, you were right. You alone possess his mystery. And we come back to you. Save us from ourselves. This is a deep, deep, deep condemnation of the will of man. And the ability of man. Yeah, it's it's very anti-human. I mean, it, it it just assumes the worst of everyone, like without the possibility of anything greater. But that's what Ivan is explaining, and that's almost also that's what the socialist. This yeah. is socialism. No, oh no, you can I can hear it very clearly. Like it it, it comes through very clearly. Like this is. This is a collectivist take. Right. It's 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 free will and, and individuality and all these things. I'm striving for bread. I'm oppressed by my Now give up all of that. If you just give me bread and you give me mystery and you give me something to believe in and something to And he says earlier, he says, even after all of the gods have been destroyed, they will pick up new idols. Right? And what he's talking about is even after we're all atheists, we'll worship idea, worship the state, we'll worship the state, because that's what this is all about. It's all about he's explaining how the power hungry authoritarians are simply using Christianity as a means of the devil's principles, which is the power. And the power lies in those of the three temptations against Christ. Which is a, isn't that a warning in the Bible to like be wary of basically the authoritarians who will that the that's church? the under that's n maybe what it is, but that is the underlying argument that the genius of Dostoevsky is making. Is he's by writing this, he's also letting you know that the three temptations to Christ are the three church, corrupt states, state abuse of powers, but they will promise you bread. 
They will promise you mystery and something to believe in. And they will promise you unity and universality and power and equality. He's or letting equity. You, right. He's letting you know. What was that about warning in the Bible? So it's not necessarily, I don't know that it's a warning in the Bible, but three temptations of Christ that Satan gives him is, you know, as, as reiterated and kind of reformulated here is the idea of feeding everyone. Like, like you can feed everyone and, and then everything will be great. The other one is to come down on high and let people know that you are God, right? To give them miracles to give people something to worship and something to believe in. But this is against man's free will. So Jesus doesn't do this. And the third is to be ruler of the world to everyone. And what he's saying is the church, the state, the authoritarians, all of these people, what they're saying is, is that people will finally be happy when the state, when the powers that be take away their freedom, but they give them food, they give them they give them meaning and they rule the entire world because once they rule the entire world, war will be gone. Well, I was kind of talking about like the warnings about the antichrist and how he will kind of like, he will appear holy. Mm -hmm. And like, that's kind of what the church is doing is like, beware of people, beware of things that seem too good to be true. Like Jesus was, had a lot of humility and it, like he didn't, you know, do right. you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's setting up the church during the Inquisition, at the very least, um, as a representation of the devil's principles. He calls these the devil's principles. The promise of giving up your freedom to authority. But this is Ivan the Atheist arguing against Alyosha. So it's really a steel man of the atheists attack on the church from Dostoevsky, who is a devout Christian. So he's recognizing the good parts of their arguments and saying, yeah, the church is flawed and the church is full of men that want for power. And this is what men that want for power do. And this is how they twist. So the reason he's using Jesus and how showing how the church goes against Jesus is he's also steel manning his own position quite eloquently which is that even if Jesus himself came back today, these corrupt institutions of the church put him in check. And burn him at the stake. And burn, and burn him at the stake. Because that is what these corrupt hierarchical structures have done to the word of God. It's, 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 it's full of layers. It's like an onion. It's like, it's like an onion. Or yeah. a parfait. But I mean, that's why Dostoevsky is seen as one of the greatest writers. Of that was very well done. Yeah. So we'll continue. Receiving bread from us, they will see clearly that we take the bread made of their hands from them, give it to them without any miracle. They will see that what we do not change the stones to bread, but in truth, they will be more thankful for taking it from our hands than for the bread itself. For they will remember only too well that in the old days, without our help, even the bread they made turned to stones in their hands. While since they have come back to us, the very stones have turned to bread in their hands. Too, too well will they know the value of complete submission. And until men know that, they will be unhappy. Who is most to blame for their not knowing it? Speak! Who scattered the flock and sent it astray on unknown paths? But the flock will come together again and will submit once more, and it will be and it will all and will be once for all. Then we shall give them the quite humble happiness of weak creatures such as they are by nature. Oh, we all we shall persuade them at last not to be proud, for thou didst lift them up and thereby taught them to be proud. We shall show them that they are weak. They are only pitiful children, but that childlike happiness is the sweetest of all. They will become timid and will look to us and huddle close to us in fear as chicks to the hen. 
They will marvel at us and will be all stricken before us and will be proud at our being so powerful and so clever that we've been able to subdue such a turbulent flock of thousands of millions. They will tremble impotent, impotently before our wrath. Their minds will grow fearful. They will be quick to shed tears like women and children, but they will be just as ready at a sign from us to pass laughter and rejoicing to happy mirth and childish song. Yes, we shall set them to work, but in their leisure hours, we shall make their life like a child's game with children's songs and innocent dance. Oh, we shall allow them even sin. They are weak and helpless and they will love us like children because we allow them to sin. We shall tell them that every sin will be expiated. It is done with our permission that we allow them to sin because we love them and the punishment for these sins we take upon ourselves. And we shall take it upon ourselves and they will adore us as their saviors who they have taken on themselves their sins before god and they will have no secrets from us we shall allow or forbid them to live with their wives and mistresses to have or not to have children according to whether or not they have been obedient or disobedient and they will submit to us gladly gladly and cheerfully the most painful secrets of their conscience all all they will bring to us and we shall have an answer for all and they will be glad to believe our answer for it will save them from the great anxiety and terrible agony they endure at present in making a free decision for themselves and all will be happy all the millions of creatures except the hundred thousand who rule over them for only we we who guard the mystery shall be unhappy there will be thousands of millions of happy babes and a hundred thousand sufferers who will take upon themselves the curse of the knowledge of good and evil. Peacefully they will die, peacefully they will expire in thy name, and beyond the grave they will find nothing but death. But we shall keep the secret, and for their happiness we shall allure them with the reward of heaven and eternity. Though if there were anything in the other world, it would certainly not be for such as they. It is prophesied that thou will come again in victory. Thou will come with thou will come with thy chosen, the proud and strong. But we will say that they have only they will say sorry. But we will say that they have only saved themselves, but we have saved all. We are told that the harlot who sits upon the beast and holds in her hands the mystery shall be put to shame. That the weak will rise up again and will rend her purple and will strip naked her loathsome body. And then I will stand up and point out to thee the thousand millions of unhappy children who have known no sin. And we shall have taken their sins upon us for their happiness will stand up before thee and say, judge us if thou canst and darest. Know that I fear thee not. Know that I too have been in the wilderness. I too have lived on roots and locusts. I too prized the freedom with which thou have blessed men. And I too was striving to stand among thy elect, among the strong and powerful, thirsting to make up the number. But I awakened and will not serve madness. I turned back and joined the ranks of those who have corrected thy work. I left the proud and went back to the humble for the happiness of the humble. What I say to thee will come to pass and our dominion will be built up. I repeat tomorrow, thou shalt see that obedient flock who at a sign from me will hasten to heap up the hot cinders about the pile on which I shall burn thee for coming to hinder us. For if anyone has ever deserved our fires, it is thou. Tomorrow I shall burn thee. So he's going to burn Jesus Christ at the stake. <laughs> As one does. As one does for the crime of, 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 of deigning that men should be free. And that men will only find happiness by submission to a greater authority. And by submission to equality. And by submission to everyone gets bread. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it. Oh yeah, it's a fucking evil speech doesn't get more evil than this speech, but it's still amazing. Ivan stopped. He was carried away as he talked and spoke with excitement. When he had finished, he suddenly smiled. Alyosha had listened in silence. Toward the end, he was greatly moved and seemed several times on the point of interrupting, but restrained himself. Now his words came with a rush. But that's absurd, he cried, flushing. 
Your poem is in praise of Jesus, not in blame of him, as you meant it to be. And who will believe you about freedom? Is that the way to understand it? That's not the idea of it in the Orthodox Church. That's Rome, and not even the whole of Rome. It's false. Those are the worst of the Catholics, the Inquisitors, the Jesuits. And there could not be such a fantastic creature as your Inquisitor. What are these sins of mankind they take on themselves? Who are these keepers of the mystery who have taken some curse upon themselves for the happiness of mankind? When have they been seen? We know the Jesuits. They are spoken ill of. But surely they are not what you describe. They are not at all. Not at all. They are simply the Romish, the Romish army for the earthly sovereignty of the world in the future, with the pontiff of Rome for emperor. That's their ideal, but there's no sort of mystery or lofty melancholy about it. It's simple lust for power, a filthy earthly gain, of domination, something like a universal serfdom with them as masters, that's all they stand for. They don't believe in God, perhaps. Your suffering inquisitor is a mere fantasy. <laughs> stay, stay, Ivan laughed. How hot you are. A fantasy, you say? Let it be so. Of course it's a fantasy. But allow me to say, do you really think that the Roman Catholic movement of the last centuries is acting nothing but the lust of power, of filthy earthly gain? Is that Father Pacey's teaching? That's his, the monk's, uh, no, no, on the contrary, Father Pacey did once say something rather the same as you. But of course, it's not the same. Not a bit of it the same. Alyosha hastily corrected himself. A precious admission in spite of your not a bit of the same. I ask you why your Jesuits and Inquisitors have united simply for vile material gain. Why can they be? Why can there not be among them one martyr opposed by great sorrow and loving humanity? You see, only suppose there was one such man, all those who desire nothing but filthy material gain. If there's only one like my old inquisitor who had himself eaten roots in the desert and made frenzy efforts to subdue his flesh, to make himself free and perfect, but yet he all his life. He, he, oh, I'm sorry. Was, it, was he talking about like having a shamanic? experience in the desert well that's well, how, eating, eating roots in the desert that's that's how the old school orthodox took the, the 40 days and 40 nights but it, it was a shamanic trip like with drugs well, maybe not that specifically but it was certainly a i mean he did go off into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights and eat nothing but grubs and whatever he could find and then maybe he hallucinated on the oh Okay. You see, only suppose that there was one such man, yet he had his flesh to make himself free and perfect. But yet, all his life he loved humanity, and suddenly his eyes were opened, and he saw that it is no great moral blessedness to attain perfection and freedom. If at the same time one gains the conviction that millions of God's creatures have been created as a mockery, that they will never be capable of using their freedom. That these poor rebels can never turn into giants to complete the tower. That it is not for such geese that the great idealist dreamt his dream of harmony. Seeing all that, he turned back and joined the clever people. Surely that could have happened. Joined whom? What clever people? Cried Alyosha, completely carried away. They have no such cl great cleverness and no mysteries and secrets. Perhaps nothing but atheism. That's all their secret. Your Inquisitor does not believe in God. That's his secret. <clears throat> what if so? At last you have guessed it. It's perfectly true. It's true that that's the whole secret. But isn't that suffering, at least for a man like that, who has wasted his whole life in the desert and yet could not shake off his incurable love of humanity? In his old age, he reached the clear conviction that nothing but the advice of the great dread spirit could build up any tolerable sort of life for the feeble, unruly, incomplete, empirical creatures created in jest. And so, convinced of this, he sees that he must follow the counsel of the wise spirit, the dread spirit of death and destruction, and therefore accept lying and deception and lead men consciously to death and destruction, and yet deceive them all the way so that they may not notice where they are being led, and that the poor blind creatures may at least on the way think themselves happy. And note, the deception is in the name of him who, in whose ideal the old man had so fervently believed all his life long. Is not that tragic? 
And if only one such stood at the head of the whole army, filled with the lust of power only for the sake of filthy gain, would not one such be enough to make a tragedy? More than that, one such standing at the head is enough to create the actual leading idea of the Roman church with all its armies and Jesuits, its highest idea. I tell you frankly that I firmly believe that there has always been such a man amongst those who stood at the head of the movement. Who knows? There may have been uh, some such even among the Roman popes. Who knows? Perhaps the spirit of the accursed old man who loves mankind so ostensibly in his own way is to be found even now in a whole multitude of old such men existing, not by chance, but by agreement, as a secret league formed long ago for the guarding of the mystery, to guard it from the weak and the unhappy, so as to make them happy. No doubt it's so, and so it must be indeed. I fancy that even among the Masons, there's something of the same mystery at the bottom, and that's why the Catholics so detest the Masons as their rivals breaking up the unity of the idea. While it's so essential that there only should be one flock and one shepherd. But from the way I defend my idea, I might be an author impatient of your criticism. Enough of it. You are perhaps a mason yourself, broke suddenly from Alyosha. You don't believe in God, he added, speaking this time very sorrowfully. He fancied, him, he fancied besides that his brother was looking at him ironically. How does your poem end, he asked suddenly, looking down, or was it the end? I meant it to end like this. When the Inquisitor... I was at the cat. <laughs> I meant it to end like this. It's just this. bad timing. <laughs> I meant it to end like this. When the Inquisitor ceased speaking, he waited some time for his prisoner to answer him. His silence weighed down upon him. He saw that the prisoner had listened intently all the time, looking gently in his face and evidently not wishing to reply. The old man longed for him to say something, however bitter and terrible, but he suddenly approached the old man in silence, softly kissed him on his bloodless aged lips. That was all his answer. The old man shuddered, his lips moved, he went to the door, opened it, and said to him, Go and come no more. Come not at all. Never, never. And he led him out in the dark alleys of the town. The prisoner went away. And the old man? The kiss glows in his heart, but the old man adheres to his ideas. And you with him? You too? cried Alyosha mournfully. Ivan laughed. Well, that was... A lot. It's Dostoevsky. The best thing about it is they continue having an argument. Um, and then he talks, he tells the story where he makes the claim. If, um, if God is not real, everything is permitted. He tells the story, his defense that God is not real is the Turkish soldiers, um, playing, um, playing toss around with a baby on a bayonets, throwing a baby beneath each other and saying, well, God's not real. So everything's I mean, that's the argument is like it, but it's it's an argument and a defense at the same time of Christianity it's an interesting kind of back and forth but anyways at the end Alyosha comes to him and kisses him on the lips and goes to walk away and Ivan says that's plagiarism that's not fair <laughs> uh, that sounds like a goddamn commie you just watched a clip from our Twitch channel, Fabian Liberty. If you like content like this, please like and subscribe here on YouTube, or go ahead and give us a follow on twitch.tv backslash Fabian Liberty.